subject of the restriction and uh, the subject of uh, time setting versus no time setting. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would uh, open our eyes and anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may see clearly. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that your holy angels would uh, draw near to us and prepare our hearts so to comprehend thy word that we shall be charmed with its beauty, admonished by its warnings, or animated and strengthened by its promises. We pray that you would help us to understand more clearly those things easy to be understood and help us not to rest those scriptures which are difficult of comprehension. We pray that the entrance of thy words may give light to our souls. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this study is called The Restriction. And you'll understand as we go through this study why I call it The Restriction because there has been in the history of God's people uh, a restriction put upon us in regards to time setting, but we need to understand that more fully. Uh, this is actually a, a, a repetition of a study that I gave, I'm sure it was less than a year ago, but I've expanded it, it somewhat since then. And uh, I won't claim that it's perfect, there are some, still some questions I have about it, but I, I think the conclusions are inescapable. So, uh, you don't have this on your notes, but I want to, just to kind of get us oriented here, uh, refer to at least two of the restrictions, if not more. In Matthew 24, verse 36, and we're going to refer back to this verse later on, Jesus said, But of that day and an hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So you have a restriction there. No man knows the day nor the hour. And it wasn't until I began to study that, this subject more earnestly because I realized months ago, and we still have the same uh, questions that are rising in this movement, uh, but it wasn't until I began to understand this or study this more carefully months ago that I connected Matthew 24, 36, the, the verse we just read with uh, Revelation uh, 10 and verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. And we understand from Sister White that uh, that time is prophetic time. Okay, let me go, let me take you to another uh, restriction, and this is on your notes, the very first reference that we have in the notes to 2 Thessalonians 2 and verses 1 through 4. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verses 1 through 4. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ there, we need to uh, understand that uh, correctly, but that is not our subject. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So pretty much Paul is saying, don't think that, the, that, that Christ's coming is going to be in your day, in our day. It will not come except there come a falling away first. Now, you have in your notes uh, a, 
passage from Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation, pages 521 to 523. I hope those pages are correct. I know I got it from the book that I have at home, not from the, well, no, it would be from the Internet. It's, it's, it's a shame how they have changed these books and have changed um, the page numbering. But uh, anyway, it's in the chapter, I forgot the name of the chapter, but uh, it's dealing with Revelation, uh, no, not Revelation, yeah, Revelation 10. But anyway, so it, it reads, um, the chronology of the events, you know, I'll tell you what, in, in the interest of time, let's drop down to where he quotes Uriah Smith quotes 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 3. We won't, we won't read those again. We just read them. And so mainly I want to read what is in the bold. So uh, Uriah Smith says, Here, Paul introduces to our view the man of sin, the little horn, the papacy, and covers, notice, with a caution the whole period of his supremacy, which, as already noticed, continued 1260 years, ending in 1798. In 1798, therefore, the restriction, this is why we're, we're naming this study the restriction, against proclaiming the day of Christ at hand ceased. Okay? So you have here, and as you can see here on the board, we have... The restriction is from 538 to 1798, the long period of the, of the reign of the man of sin. Uh, the man of sin is revealed. You have the falling away first, and then the man of sin is revealed. And we'll, we'll address this uh, more later. Now, no, the title of where the title of the chapter. The chapter. Okay. Oh, thank you. I, I misunderstood you. Yes. Uh, Brother Jason said that the uh, name of the chapter in uh, Daniel Revelation is Proclamation of the Advent. Even the chapter titles, they've changed, and you can find one title in one book and another in another book. Okay, so it's in the, nevertheless, it's in the portion of Daniel Revelation where he's addressing the book of Revelation. All right, so now the next statement that we're going to uh, read from, and this is... Uh, from Great Controversy 355 to 356. A lot of this study is based upon that uh, passage, and it's from Great Controversy in the chapter, A Great Religious Awakening. So what I've done, just to let you know where I'm going with this, what I've done is I have taken Sister White's words, the first two pages in that chapter, and use them as a pattern for our movement. Okay, so she begins, and also I want, to, I want you to understand that uh, the passage we read a few moments ago from Uriah Smith is reflected in uh, Sister White's writings there on Great Controversy, page 355-356. So she says, a great religious awakening under the proclamation of Christ's soon coming is foretold in the prophecy of the first angel's message of Revelation 14. An angel is seen flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. With a loud voice, he proclaims the message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, verses 6 and 7. So she's quoting the first angel's message, and uh, okay, we won't go there yet. Just, I want to just stay on track here. The fact that an angel is said to be the herald of this warning is significant. By the purity, the glory, and the power of the heavenly messenger, divine wisdom has been pleased to represent the exalted character of the work to be accomplished by the message and the power and glory that were to attend it. And the angel's flight in the midst of heaven, the loud voice with which the warning is uttered, 
and his proclamation to all that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, give evidence of the rapidity and worldwide extent of the movement. What I wanted to bring out, and I think all of us in this movement should, under, should understand, that the first angel's message was repeated there at 9-11, right? All of this, all of what we're reading in these patches, passages is repeated in our movement. And the movement is worldwide. Uh, but let's go on. The message itself, the message itself, the message of the everlasting gospel sheds light as to the time when this movement is to take place. It is declared to be a part of the everlasting gospel, and it announces the opening of the judgment. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages, but this message is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days, for only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. The prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of his prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on, a, on the fulfillment of these prophecies. So not until we reach... 1798, could a message proclaiming the judgment near be given? Not until 1798. So you can see, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Hang on a second. So let's go to the next paragraph. Let's finish this paragraph. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of, the, fulfillment of these prophecies but at the time of the, of the end, the time of the end, 1798, but at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So it continues. The apostle Paul warned the church not to look for the coming of Christ in his day. So that's this period right here. That day shall not come. That day shall not come. He says, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. Not till after the great apostasy, the long period of the reign of the man of sin, okay, not till after the great apostasy and the long period of the reign of the man of sin can we look for the advent of our Lord. The man of sin, which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition, and that wicked represents the papacy, which, as foretold in the prophecy, was to, was to maintain its supremacy for 1,260 years. So this is your 1,260 years right here. This period ended in 1798. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. It couldn't, ha couldn't happen before 1798. It is this side of that message that the mess... It is this side of that time that time being right here, 1798, it is this side of that time that the message of Christ's second coming is to be proclaimed. And of course, the coming of the judgment near, or the pro proclamation of the judgment near would be pointing to October 22nd, 1844. Uh, the next paragraph, no such message has ever been given in past ages. No such message was given in past ages, but I'm, I'm narrowing it down to, to the 1260 years of papal supremacy, okay? No such message has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed a judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But since 1798, since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed, knowledge of the, of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. Now, 
Now, let's go to James White. And the next passage is going to be from his book, Bible Adventism. And uh, we won't read the entire passage. I have it there so you can see it for yourself, see the whole thing in context. But uh, what I want to do is um, drop down almost to page to the bottom of page two on your notes. He says, those who claim that the text, he's, he's pointing here, he's addressing uh, uh, Matthew verses, uh, chapter 24, verses 36 and 37. Let's go ahead and read that again so we'll get oriented here and know exactly what we're talking about. Matthew 24. Verses 36 and 37. But of that day and an hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So he says, Those who claim that the text proves that nothing may be known of the period of the second advent make it prove too much for their own belief. What did I? Uh, own, own unbelief. Sorry. Those who claim that the text proves that nothing may be known of the period of the second advent make it prove too much for their own unbelief. As recorded by Mark, the declaration reads, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. The text proves that men will know, if the text proves that men will know nothing of the period of the second advent, it also proves that angels will know nothing of it, and also that the Son will know nothing of it, till the event takes place. This position proves too much, therefore proves nothing to the, to the point. Christ will know of the period of the second advent of the world, the holy angels who wait around the throne of heaven, to receive messages relative to the part they act in the salvation of men will know of the time of, his, of this closing event of salvation, and so will the waiting, watching people of God understand. Now, <clears throat> the next paragraph states, an old English version of the passage reads, quote, But that day and hour no man maketh known neither the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. This is the correct reading, according to several of the ablest critics of the age. The word know is used in the same sense here that it is by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know or make known anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Men will not make known the day and hour, Angels will not make it known, neither the Son, but the Father will make it known. And says Campbell, McKnight argues that the term know is here used as a causative in the Hebrew sense of the con conjugation, hip hill, which, uh, well, that is, to make known. His, Christ's answer is just equivalent to saying, the Father will make it known when it pleases Him. But He has not authorized man, angel, or the Son to make it known. Just in this sense, Paul uses the term know. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I came uh, to, to you making known the testimony of God, for I determined to make known nothing among you but a crucified Christ. Um, I know I have it elsewhere in this study, but I'm, I'm going to go to it now because it's an opportune time. What James White is bringing out here and others is no different, brothers and sisters, than Revelation 1, the, ver the very first verse. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto, unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So you have the same, the same um, pattern, if you will. The same, uh, there's another, another word for it. I'm, I, the same what? Sequence. Sequence would be a good word. Process. Process. 
uh, so you have the revelation of Jesus, which, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, as God the Father gave unto Jesus Christ. Okay, and He, Christ, sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant John. So you have the same as the Father, the Son, the angels, and men. The same, the same pattern, same uh, wording. Okay. So, let's go again. Yeah, and you have Revelation 1, verse 1 there on page 4 of your notes. Now, one statement that goes well with all of this is uh, the next statement from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, 4B, page 123. And I won't read the whole thing there. You can read it for yourself. But I believe the sentence that is bolded in the middle of the paragraph stands on its own merit. It says, Some passages are placed beyond the reach of human minds until such a time as God chooses in his own wisdom to open them. Some people might stretch that statement and try to make it say, well, you know, God doesn't want us to know these things. But it says, some passages are placed beyond the reach of human mi minds until such a time as God chooses in his own wisdom to open them. And you can apply that broadly to a lot of passages, a lot of prophecies. God does not reveal them until he chooses. And nevertheless, he does reveal them. That's a fact that cannot be denied. Okay, then volume three of the testimonies is, is the next statement, page 258. The word of the Lord spoken through his servants is received by many with questionings and fears. And many will defer their obedience to the warning and reproofs given, waiting till every shadow of uncertainty is removed from their minds. And I'm, I'm reading, I'm putting this passage in here because some, even in this movement, seem to think that they have to have perfect knowledge in all things. And sometimes the Lord does give us perfect knowledge, relatively speaking, but our faith isn't to rest always on perfect knowledge. She says, the unbelief that demands perfect knowledge will never yield to the evidence God is pleased to give. He requires of his people faith that rests upon the weight of evidence, not upon perfect knowledge. Those followers of Christ who accept the light that God sends them must obey the voice of God speaking to them when there are many other voices crying out against it. And as we will find during the Millerite movement, there were people that were opposing Miller's message, and one of their main sayings was, No man knoweth the day nor the hour. The majority were saying that. It requires discernment to distinguish the voice of God. Those who will not act when the Lord calls upon them, but who wait for more certain evidence and more favorable opportunities will walk in darkness, for the light will be withdrawn. The evidence given one day, if rejected, must never be, uh, will, may never be repeated. You know, in a, in a court of law, the same principle holds. What are the decisions based upon? the weight of evidence. Now, the next passage is from the same chapter that I'm basing this study on, that chapter in Great Controversy, uh, A Great Religious Awakening. And further on in that chapter, on page, uh, page 359 to 360, Sister White uh, begins to... Uh, talk about Joseph Wolf and what he said, because Wolf preached a similar message as that of William Miller. Wolf believed the coming of the Lord to be at hand. His interpretation of the prophetic periods placing the great consummation within a very few years of the time pointed out by Miller. To those who urged from the scripture, 
of that day and hour knoweth no man, that men are no, to know nothing concerning the nearness of the, of the advent, Wolf replied, Did our Lord say that that day and hour should never be known? Did he not give us signs of the times in order that we may know at least the approach of his coming, as one knows the approach of the summer by the fig tree putting forth its leaves? Are we never to know that period, whilst he himself exhorteth us not only to read Daniel the prophet, but to understand it? And in that very Daniel, where it is said that the words were shut up to the end, to the time of the end, which is the case in his time, which was the case in his time, that many shall run to and fro, a Hebrew expression for observing and thinking upon the time and knowledge regarding that time shall be increased. <coughs> Excuse me. Besides this, our Lord did not intend to say by this that the approach of the time shall not be known, but that the exact day and hour knoweth no man. Enough, he does say, shall be known by the signs of the times to induce us to prepare for his coming as Noah prepared the ark. Okay, so now the next passage is from Great Controversy, again the same chapter, Great Controversy 370 to 371, the same chapter as the chapter entitled uh, A Great Religious Awakening. The Sister White, to a large degree, she echoes what Wolf said. The proclamation of a definite time for Christ's coming called forth great opposition for many, uh, from many of all classes. I want to stop right there in the middle of that sentence and encourage and challenge everyone listening to this, to do a word study in the spirit of prophecy on definite time. This is not the only place where she mentions definite time. She mentions definite time in other passages in, in, uh, in various ways. But it, 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 it is a worthwhile study, small study, but a worthwhile study just to type in the words, in quotes, uh, definite time. Um, so, it says, The proclamation of a definite time for Christ coming called forth great opposition from many of all classes, from the minister in the pulpit down to the most reckless, heaven-daring sinner. The words of prophecy were fulfilled. There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, many who professed to love the Savior, many who professed to love the Savior, declared that they had no opposition to the doctrine of the second advent. They merely objected to the definite time. Sounds like, sounds like a good excuse, doesn't it? But God's all-seeing eye read their hearts, they did not wish to hear of Christ's coming to judge the world in righteousness. They had been unfaithful servants. Their works would not bear the inspection of the heart-searching God, and they feared to meet their Lord. Like the Jews at the time of Christ's first advent, they were not prepared to welcome Jesus. They not only refused to listen to the plain arguments from the Bible, but ridiculed those who were looking for the Lord. Satan and his angels exalted and flung the taunt in the face of Christ and holy angels that his professed people had so little love for him that they did not desire his appearing. Now, one thing that we need to consider in all of this, which should have been put in this study, we believe that the parable of the ten virgins is, has been and is being repeated in this movement. And it seems to me that if that is true, and it is, that this controversy would arise once more. That people would say, no man knoweth the day nor the hour when we are preaching definite time. Let's go on. 
No man knoweth the day nor the hour was the argument most often brought forth by rejectors of the Advent faith. The scripture is, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 36. A clear and harmonious explanation of this text was given by those who were looking for the Lord, and the wrong use made of it by their opponents was clearly shown. The words were spoken by Christ in that memorable conversation with his disciples upon Olivet, there in Matthew 24, after he had for some time departed from the temple. The disciples had asked the question, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus gave them signs and said, When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Notice, one saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. Now, we're going to come back. Remember that statement. Remember that last uh, sentence. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal, will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was coming. Remember that statement because we will go right back to it in just a few minutes. Going on to the next statement here, and it's going to be from... Uh, Yes, from Great Controversy, page 308 to 309. Uh, we're going to not read the entire passage, dropping down to the second paragraph. Um, I think we, we, will, we, we will go ahead and read that first paragraph. Christ had bidden his people watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. When these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, When they now shoot forth, ye know, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. And when... She's pointing it. We know this from our past uh, knowledge. And she's pointing here to 9-11 and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But this is the same thing as pointing to, as in the time of Miller, pointing to the judgment. In this case, in our day, it's pointing towards the, in, uh, the uh, judgment of the living. Okay. Now, going on to the next paragraph, but as the spirit of humility and devotion in the church had given place to pride and formalism, love for Christ and faith in his coming had grown cold. What period is she speaking about here? She's evidently speaking of this time period right here that ends in 1798. But the, brothers and sisters, I'm going to submit to you that the same has happened in the Seventh-day Adventist, in, in, in Adventism. Okay, let's go on. Absorbed in worldliness and pleasure-seeking, the professed people of God were blinded to the Savior's instructions concerning the signs of His appearing. The doctrine of the Second Advent had been neglected. The scriptures relating to it were obscured by misinterpretation until it was, to a great extent, ignored and forgotten. And she says, especially was this true in the case, in the case of the churches in America. But though it was true especially in America, that was nothing but the culmination 
of the 1260 years of darkness, the darkness that covered the earth, the spiritual darkness that covered the earth during the 1260 years of papal supremacy was the cause of this. And the people at that time were just coming out of, if not ending, that darkness. Um, now, notice, <clears throat> as I said just a moment ago, the same has been repeated in the Advent movement. And I'm saying here, from 1863 till, seven, till, till, till uh, 1989, a period of 126 years, one-tenth of the 1260 years, one-tenth pertaining to the remnant, when God is raising up a remnant, okay, this is applicable to our, to our studies. So, she says here in Medical Ministry, page 174, many have already lost their first love for the great grand Bible truths concerning Christ's second coming. Many. Now, notice that this was written in 1908, okay? Uh, I'm just realizing here, it's manuscript 63. <sighs> okay. From the review, now, this is from early, the next statement is from early writings, page 107 to 108. Uh, the 63 is the same thing as the 1260, right? Yes. Yeah. So you... What's that? Half of yeah, half of 126. 1,260 is half of the 2520. Yes. Say that again. 1,260 is half of the 2520. Yeah. The 1,226 is one tenth of the 1,260, and so, half of the 1,226 is 63. Yeah. So it's it's all it's all the 2520. Yep. Yeah. The 2520 to 126, 63 is all the 2520. Um, okay, so now the next statement from Early Writings, page 107, 108. She says, now, notice that this was written in 1852. So this covers even before 1863. Even before 1863, this statement was written. She says, as I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal like the nominal churches from which they uh, but a short time since separated the words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. They are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness and zealously repent and obtain gold tried in the fire, white raiment and eyes have, he will spew them out of his mouth. The time has come when a large portion of those who once rejoiced and shouted aloud for joy in view of the immediate coming of the Lord are on the ground of the churches and the world who once derided them for believing that Jesus was coming and circulated all manner of falsehoods to raise prejudice against them and destroy their influence. Now, if, one, if anyone longs after the living God, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and God gives him to feel his power and satisfies his longing soul by shedding abroad his love in his heart, and if he glorifies God by praising him, he is, by these professed believers in the soon coming of the Lord, often considered deluded and charged with being mesmerized or having some wicked spirit. So you're seeing here in this passage, you have people outside of Adventism that were ridiculing Seventh-day Adventist for believing that Christ was coming very soon. And now that same spirit then goes into Seventh-day Adventists. And among Seventh-day Adventists, if they are proclaiming that Christ is coming soon, now Seventh-day Adventists are ridiculing those Adventists. Many of these professed Christians 
dress, talk, and act like the world, and the only thing by which they may be known is their profession. Though they profess to be looking for Christ, their conversation is not in heaven, but on worldly things. So the same thing applies to Seventh-day Adventists that applied to the Protestant churches near the end of the 1260 years uh, of papal supremacy. Now, I'm going to break away from this just for a moment. Now, one thing that I have in, in here, if, if you're looking closely here at the board, whereas over here I'm saying the long period of the reign of the man of sin, the man of sin revealed, you know. Uh, here, it's the same thing from 1863 to 1989, the same thing, but I've just worded it differently to make a point. And the point is that in Adventism, it is the four insects that lay waste the vineyard. This is the same as the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Uh, just to put it in the record, let's go to Joel, chapter 1. And we're going to read from verses 3 through 7. Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, four generations. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath eaten, or hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye junk drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation, what nation? The king of the north. A nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and, ha and barked my my, my fig tree, he hath made it clean bare, and casteth, cast it away, the branches thereof are made white. This is what has happened in Adventism, which again, I say, is the same thing as the 1260 years of papal supremacy. And one of the things that comes out back to the passage we read near the big beginning of this study from Great Controversy 355, 356, she says, no such message was preached during the 1260 years, and even before that. No such message as Christ soon coming or the judgment near was preached during this time. And from 1863 to 1989, I say no such message was preached because we just read that Adventists had lost their... To get, just to get the right words, their, um, their belief in Christ's soon coming. Okay, had lost their first love. They lost, they lost their first love for, for the study of prophecy. And, and, you know, it should go without saying, especially to those of us here in this movement, we know that James White, or well, Adventists, have reject, rejected the... Uh, the charts, the, eight, the eight, uh, 1843 and 1850 chart, there in 1863, he rejected it. They, they rejected it. When you reject the charts, you reject the doctrine of Christ's second coming. The two go hand in glove. You cannot have one without the other. If you do not have a burden to study the prophetic word, you are not looking for Christ's second coming. Now, okay, the, the thing I was going to bring out, I almost forgot. Well, I'm not going to read much from this, but I would encourage everyone to read, if you can get hold of it, E.A. Sutherland's book, Studies in Christian Education. And when you read this book, if you can still tell me that Adventists have not lost 
their love for Christ's second appearing, his second coming. I don't know what else to say to you. But I'm, not, I'm only going to read just a very small portion of it. Of it. Brother, Brother Sutherland says, What the Protestant churches faced in the year 1844, we Seventh-day Adventists are facing today. We shall see how the Protestant denominations opposed the principles of Christian education and thus failed to train their young people to give the midnight cry. Seventh-day Adventist young people, thousands of whom are in the schools of the world, cannot afford to repeat this failure. The moral fall of the popular churches causing that midnight cry, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, would never have been given had they been true to the principles of Christian education. So he, he's saying the second angel's message would not have been given. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, had the churches adhered to the true principles of Christian education. If individual Seventh-day Adventists approached the loud cry with the same experience that the Protestants approached the midnight cry, they likewise will be foolish virgins to whom the door is closed. The virgins in Christ's parable all had lamps, the doctrines, but they lacked a love of truth which lights up these doctrines. The science of true education is the truth which is to be so deeply impressed on the soul that it cannot be, be obliterated by the error that everywhere abounds. The third angel's message is, is truth and light and power. He just quoted here from 6T, page 131. But what he essentially says in here is that <clears throat> the Protestant churches fell and did not recognize the judgment hour message because they had been influenced by papal education. Seventh-day Adventism has likewise been influenced by papal education. We, we, it would take a long time to show that, but it doesn't take much study to find that out. All right, so the next statement is going to be from a, a long passage from uh, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1051, 1052. We won't read the entire thing, but I'm, what I would rather do here, we'll, we'll come back to the statement, but I think I might have ordered these passages in the wrong, wrong way. I think it would be better for us to momentarily skip that long passage and go to the next one from... Um, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 507. Because what I'm going to say here is that <clears throat> we need to understand the statement from the SDA, SDA Bible Commentary in light of this statement from Testimonies to Ministers. Because she says in Testimonies to Ministers, this is at the bottom of page 7 of your notes, many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. All right. <coughs> Remember that statement. Go, go backwards in your notes. And... Uh, Let's see here. Yes. If you go up near the top of page 7 of your notes, I'm going to read from this passage from the SDA, the SDA Bible Commentary, where it begins, Jesus said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All that was done and said had this one object in view. To rivet, to rivet the truth in their minds that they might attain unto everlasting life. Jesus did not come to astonish men with some great announcement of some special time. That special time is the same as what she's talking about in Testimonies to Ministers. The people waiting uh, for the, for uh, how does it read there, 
It says, many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. So back to this uh, Bible commentary, she says, uh, Jesus did not come to astonish men by some great, with, with some great announcement of some special time when some great event would occur, but he came to instruct and save the lost. Uh, he did not come to arouse and gratify curiosity, for he knew that this would but increase the appetite for the curious and the marvelous. It was his aim to impart knowledge whereby men might increase in spiritual strength and advance in the way of holiness and true uh, in, uh, way of obedience and true holiness. He gave only such instruction as could be appropriated to the needs of their daily life. Only such truth as could give to others, as could be given to others for the same approbation. Okay, now, what, what, what was that? Appropriation. Appropriation, rather. Okay, but open to their understanding truths. I'm getting mixed, I'm losing my place. Okay, he gave only such instruction as could be appropriated to the needs of their daily life, only such truth as could be given to others for the same appropriation. Okay. So I wanted to make that point there. People are, were waiting, are waiting even now for some great event to happen. But we are to receive the former rain first, as it says in Testimonies to Ministers 507. Now, the next paragraph, let's go back to um, Testimonies to Ministers, that, that passage. Near the bottom, this is going to be on page 8 of your notes, okay? It says in the bold, unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Um, yeah. So when you go back to the page 7 of your notes in the SDA, Bible, the SDA Bible Commentary passage, near the bottom, or actually the very bottom of that, of that passage, it says, there will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Now the question to be asked is, as Joseph Wolf asked, are we never to know? Are we never to know? Now, notice that in that last sentence, or last two sentences, she puts together the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the coming of Christ in the same sentence. Okay. She says, we are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. And we just read from Testimonies to Ministers that we are to recognize. So if we are to recognize the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then sanctified reasoning tells me that we are to know the time when Christ's coming is near. Okay? So this, to me, really uh, flies against the accusation that, we are, that some are making that we shouldn't even be uh, uh, making these definite time prophecies. And the other thing that I wanted to bring out, I told you a while ago to remember that Sister White, let's go back to uh, a few pages back where the statement from... Um, Yes. On page five of your notes, halfway down the page, that passage from Great Controversy, page 371, we are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us, in other words, it will be a fatal mistake, 
terrible mistake, as she says in Testimonies to Ministers 507, will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. All right? So, back to... Let's see here. Yes. Back to page 7. Page 7. And the passage there from SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, the second to the last paragraph, last sentence, we should ask with sincerity, what shall I, we, we, we should ask with true sincerity, what shall I do to be saved? We should know just what steps we are taking heavenward. And if you read the entire passage, she's saying, don't look for some uh, great event that's going to arouse you. Just wait until that event, and then you start arousing and getting ready. She's saying, all the while, we should be asking, what shall I do to be saved? And what did Noah and his family do to be saved? They built the ark, and they got on the ark. So when, when we ask the question in any, about any subject in Christianity, in Adventism, what shall I do to be saved? It's not just a matter of saying, well, I accept Christ as my Savior. You accept the light, the present truth light that is shining upon you and the, the, the generation that you are living in. In the time of Noah, it was building the ark, getting on the ark. In the time of Christ, it was accepting Christ as the Messiah. In the time of Miller, it was it, accepting the message of the of the judgment hour. Okay. So we are to ask what, today, what shall I do to be saved? And that's a very broad question, but we need to, we need to ask ourselves, what shall I do? What should we do to be saved in this time? All right. Now, one other thing, too, in regards to not knowing the day and hour of Christ's coming, as was asked already, are we never to know? Well, Great Controversy 640, 640 says, the voice of God is heard. This is at near the time of Christ's second coming. The voice of God is heard from heaven declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people. Now, try to bring this to a close here. So we have the 1260 years of papal supremacy, 538 to 1798. You have that restriction. It is, as we read in the, in the passages near the beginning of this study, study this morning, there was a caution, okay? There was a restriction. Can't proclaim the day of Christ near. Uh, the coming of Christ could not take place, Paul said, until 1798. And if you use the same pattern coming down here from 1863 to 1989, a period of 126 years, no such message, no such message could be proclaimed. And I'm calling the 1260 years the Christian dispensation. And from 1863 to 18, uh, 1989, the, I'm calling it the Adventist dispensation. During that time, it could not be proclaimed that Christ was, or the judgment was near. After this time, now the book of Daniel is unsealed. This side of that time, the message of Christ's second coming is proclaimed. The day of Christ is at hand. There's a great religious awakening after 1989, after 1798. Now we come to October 22nd, and what does it say? Let's go to Revelation 10. Revelation 10. And we're going to read verse 6. Let's go ahead and read um, verses 1 through 6. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. 
And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right hand upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. I want to put to you, I want to present to you some more passages that I'm going to parallel here with uh, verse 6. And notice it is verse 6. All right. So, go to Exodus, verse 20, I mean chapter 20, Exodus 20, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. All right, so you just, just read those two. Notice, going, keep your hand there at uh, Exodus 20, but go back to Revelation 10, verse 6. It mentions him who created the heavens and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea. So he mentions creation. And at the end of the verse, it says that there should be time no longer. So in a weekly cycle, what I'm saying here is that at the end of the sixth day, time no longer. No longer time to work. Okay? Go to, you might, you might, might want to try to keep your finger in all these places. Go to Matthew 24. We already read this verse, but we need to, we need to be there. Matthew 24, and verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay, time no longer. All right? Now, the, what do all these verses have to do with each other besides you have, you have evidently some sort of stoppage, okay? You have a point in time where, he, where it says you can't do this, all right? In each one of those, the, the very next verse, you have the word but, all right? And you have the definition of the word but, and you have some examples here. The word but in Revelation 10 verse 9, also in Matthew 4 and verse 4, and Matthew 5 and verse 5, and Matthew 5.17. Matthew 5.17 is, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Uh, Matthew uh, 5 verse 5, no, Matthew 4 verse 4 is, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of, out of the mouth of God. So in, in Revelation 10 and verse 6, it's the same word as in, there in rather, uh, Revelation 10 verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So you have the word but in verse 7, and you go to uh, Matthew 24, Verse 37, after verse 36, whenever he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, verse 37, but, same word, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And you go to Exodus 20 and verse uh, 10, but 
The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, and it goes on. I'm just showing you the harmony of all of these. And, you know, when Revelation 10, verse 6 says that there should be time no longer, it's not without significance that in verse 7, it starts out with the word but. Another word for but is nevertheless. What does nevertheless mean? The former is true, but I want you to know this in addition to that. So to me, that gives some bit of allowance for us to be investigating the prophecies and preaching definite time. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our great Father in heaven, we thank you for your leading. We thank you that you have given us your word, both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And Father, we ask for wisdom as we consider these things. We pray that all the while we will be growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to be wise virgins that will open the door for Christ to come in, not only in our hearts, but also when he appears, we shall be able to welcome him because we will be watching and waiting as you have clearly instructed us in your word. We thank you, dear Father, for hearing our prayer and guiding us this morning. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.